the figuring out what I wanted to do to be able to leave the country, I think was really the hardest part of the journey is not knowing what job would get me the ability so that I could work away, you know, because before it was always the dream as I saw it of like the retiree, like, oh, I'm going to retire and live in this country. And I was like, well, I don't want to wait till I retire, but what can I do? Hi, I'm Kim Tolson and I'm the traveling therapist. It's my passion to teach therapists how to navigate online private practices and multiple income streams so they can travel the world. I'm a digital nomad with a virtual insurance-based private therapy practice and a multi six-figure coaching business. I'm obsessed with entrepreneurship and developing tools that can help therapists live an adventurous lifestyle. In this podcast, I will discuss my journey as a digital nomad, I'll chat with other traveling therapists and help you navigate the complexities of running an online insurance-based practice. I'm so glad to have you with me on this journey. Building a private practice can be challenging. I know for me, when I was starting out, I had no idea how to get referrals. I had no idea how to manage paperwork. I knew nothing about insurance billing. The whole process was really daunting. Building a private practice can be challenging to say the least. I remember when I was starting out, I had no idea how to get referrals. I had no idea how to navigate insurance. I had no idea even what paperwork was required. So growing a caseload, navigating insurance, and managing billing and paperwork all take significant amounts of time. And that's all in addition to delivering great care to your clients. That's why Alma gives clinicians the tools they need to build a thriving private practice. When you join their insurance program, you can get credentialed within 45 days and access to enhanced reimbursement rates. They also handle all the paperwork from eligibility checks to claim submissions, and they guarantee payment within two weeks of each appointment. So in addition to their insurance program, Alma also offers time-saving tools and administrative support. So you can spend less time on paperwork and more time delivering great care to your clients and the traveling world. Learn more about building a thriving private practice with Alma at helloalma.com slash Kim. That's hello, A-L-M-A dot com slash K-Y-M to get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Traveling Therapist Podcast. Super excited to have Lenora Johnson here with us today. Lenora, I'm so glad to see you. I actually met with Lenora about a year ago. We chatted about some things. So it's really fun to see like things come around full circle to say hello again, see where everybody is, but also talk about your traveling therapist journey. So welcome to the podcast. I always start out with the question, how did she go from being your traditional therapist to a traveling therapist? Oh, that's a great question. I like to say I have been a wandering soul probably since I exited the womb and I just had nowhere to go and no fun. So (laughs) young me was given a booklet that went through every year of what job do you want and where do you want to go? And so it was one of those things parents probably give their kids with like the little school frame picture for that year. This is what I looked like in second grade and these were the jobs I wanted to have. And I think that was the spark really set it off for me because I would just check off random cities and my parents would go, how do you know about these? I'm like, I don't, but I like the sound of Boston or, you know, some of these (laughs) sorts of things. And the inspiration really started with my dad. He wanted to make sure his family went on vacation. And the one that changed me was going to Niagara Falls. We took the train ride from Detroit to Toronto, and that was just magical. And then you get to Niagara Falls and you just see things are a little bit different, you know, across the border. And so it was such a magical experience of like trying adventures that it really got me going. So fast forward to grad school, and I will even say undergrad, I was in Florida. I wound up graduating from the University of UNLV, so the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So I had probably lived between starting college, undergrad and graduating in at least three states. Oh, then that's been- amazing. <laughs> yeah. And once I became a social worker, I think I have now lived in at least five different states. Just oh my gosh. Kind of being here. And then when the, I opened up my private practice when the pandemic, you know, a little after the pandemic started, so about August of 2021, you know, at that time when travel was gone, you could travel and be around your family. You know, you guys could be protected. 
And that was really the second spark of how I started my traveling therapist work was I live on the West Coast. My family's not over here. And I wanted that closeness. And so that was kind of how I started traveling. And then I'd be like, okay, I'm going to stay with you for three weeks. And even though it's a different time zone, I'll just adjust to be like my West Coast clients didn't have to adjust. I adjusted. So (laughs) that was that pace where I said, oh, I can do this. This is a real thing. I'm going to enjoy it. So that was really how I got going. That is so cool. Oh my gosh. I have like so many follow-up questions. <laughs> so once you became a social worker, you said five different states. Did different jobs take you to different states? And then did you have to get licensed in other states? Or, or was that like even a traveling type thing where you were like doing telehealth and then back in your state of licensure? Curious. Good question. So this was just me traveling on my own. Because back then I was like, nobody pays social workers to travel. Like nobody pays us to relocate and do these things. And so honestly, I moved to Florida because I wanted to get out of the Arctic freeze that had hit Michigan in 2015. And it was brutal. I remember it being like 40 something below. And I was like, I'm out. So I interviewed for a job, moved back, like moved to Florida, worked in Florida for a little while, and then applied for a job that would relocate me back to Michigan, which was where I was from. But the job was based in Oregon. So, oh, wow. I know, right? So they moved me back. They actually moved me to Michigan. So I was licensed in Ohio. I was not licensed in Nevada, licensed mm-hmm. in Florida, then also licensed in Oregon now officially licensed in Washington, uh, also licensed in Michigan. So it was one of those things where I went back to Michigan and then had to be licensed in Oregon because that's where all the clients were. So that was my introduction to be licensed where your people are, not necessarily where you're stationed. And so my job lined up promoting me and relocating me to Oregon. And so that's kind of how I got to be on the West Coast. And because Washington State is our wonderful neighbor to the north, a lot of folks cross that border between Washington and Oregon. So logically, it made sense for me to get that license to have my business also be based in Oregon and also based in Washington State. So wow. Wow. That's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) And I have a lot of questions about that because we just my friend, at least Dr. Lisa Lovelace and I, we actually wrote a course around multi-state credentialing and licensing and how to take your practice across state lines. But it sounds like you're, how many active license do you have right now in different in different states? Well, right now I reduced it down to the two, the Washington oh, and Oregon, okay. because I think I had a little bit too much wanderlust and I would only put one foot in and not the other foot. So I was always ready to go. And so when I got to Oregon, I said, let me try this immersive experience where it's one place dedicated all my time. And it really shall I connect it with the state and how I connect it with the organizations within the state. And it was something that I had missed. And so once I did that and got my grounding, I really felt comfortable spreading those wings. And that's what made me kind of venture into kind of Washington state and providing that support because my clients will work in Oregon and go home in Washington. And I'd be like, well, now I can't see you. So that's... (laughs) So now that process allows for me to kind of cross the border in that regard. So I saw that pop up and thought, oh, wow, that's super cool that you guys are talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's a a real thing that you're talking about. I mean, a lot of people do think to be a traveling therapist, even that, you know, you've got to get licensed in a million states and then travel between all those states. And as you're alluding to, that's not really the case for the most part. It it's just depends where the client is physically located at the time of the session. And for the most part, we all know there's some exceptions. The therapist can be sitting anywhere except for Texas, North Carolina, and Alaska. And I think it's those three right now. It changes. I hear different things all the time. But as far as I know, those are the states you really have to be concerned about. So, you know, a lot of clinicians don't think they can be traveling therapists because they they maybe haven't reached out to their licensing board and really gotten the information. And it's it's not that hard to figure out. There's an app, Epstein, what's it, Epstein Bar app that's basically telehealth rules and regulations. Yeah. It's pretty much up to date. I mean, I think that's the best resource really that I found. But yeah, I'm, I'm getting off track a little bit, but you talking about it just reminds me that maybe somebody's brand new to this podcast and they might be like, wait, how, what does all this mean? So. You know, I like to touch on that a little bit because it it, it is super important. And, you know, it sounds like you at one time were licensed in a lot of states and having to keep Mm -hmm. up with 
CEUs and different regulations in each state and where do I pay taxes? And, you know, that it does get complicated. So that actually is what prompted that course that we wrote because people ask questions about this all the time. But and I'm back to you. <laughs> right. No, no. I was like, I love it. I think it's a great segue. <laughs> and I'm really happy you said that because it is a lot of work to be licensed. You know, sometimes I see people and they're like, I'm licensed in eight states. And I'm like, I can tell you the one state that I I was really shocked by the number of courses was the state of Florida, but, you know, kind of randomly bringing it up because they have required HIV. They have required laws and rules. Those can only be facilitated by certain organizations. You have to pass that like every time. So I was always shocked at the volume of money. I'm like, you guys must be rich out here because you might be spending thousands of dollars to keep all those licenses when it may not yes. necessarily serve you as well. So sorry, that sidebar, you kind of jarred. I know, right? Where I was like, I I'm not doing that. Couldn't agree more. And even people that take the course, we've got something in there that's like pros and cons. Like you really need to think this through because it's great. Yeah. Okay. You want to spread your wings. You want to get more referrals, you know, but it's complicated. It's super complicated. There's a lot to think about. It is. You know, it's good if you're like Dr. Lisa Lovelace. I mean, she's got, she owns a group practice and she's got clinicians like in every like 40 states or something crazy like that. So she really needs to know all that stuff. But not, it's not for everybody and it's not necessary either. If you're, you know, you want to be a traveling therapist and, you know, you just find a state where you could get a steady referral stream and make sure the telehealth regulations support what you want to do. And then, you know, you should be good to go. And that sounds like what you did. Like you, you branched out and then you pulled it back in and you're like, hey, Washington, Oregon, that works for me and I can still do what I want to do with my life and my traveling and all that. Exactly. And that app is super awesome. So I'm glad you brought that up. I think I saw it on your Facebook page and was like, well, this is a handy little tool to kind of keep, you know, at the ready, especially when you do domestic travel. You know, some of these states are like, if you're sitting in my soil, you're going to pay my taxes. So, you know, it's some of those small things that as we even go around, I love it you know, just the idea of both domestic and international travel, because a lot of folks have not seen a lot of America. And I think that has been, you know, a cool thing to say. And as somebody who also travels internationally, you know, it's awesome, the lived experience you get when you go another place and being able to, you know, kind of think globally, live locally was really one of the things that I embody kind of transitioning into more of this traveling role. Yeah, that, I love that so much. Yeah, like I said, I don't know if I said it this episode, but I'm in the Dominican Republic right now and it's it's a learning experience. The last episode I recorded of this podcast was somebody else that lives like at a Caribbean island <laughs> and it's like, it's nice, but there is issues. <laughs> <laughs> we we spent the whole episode talking about the issues and then we're like well why do we do it we're like oh yeah because it's beautiful it's like 84 every day the ocean's gorgeous but yeah right <laughs> so so what is what is your traveling life like right now like what are you doing how are you managing to travel you know and still see your clients how's that going for you right now you know, it's really been fantastic. What I'll say, you know, my clients are remarkable people because I am super honest. When I'm hitting the streets, I'm like, hey, I'll be in Jamaica in a couple, you know, like they get a window <laughs> and they're like, can you put me in your suitcase? But, <laughs> but they are, you know, flexible even with times. Hey, you know, I'm going to be gone this date to this date. You know, what I'll do is I might open up an extra day. So typically I'll work like a Monday through Thursday. And if I'm traveling, they know I'll say, hey, I got a flex spot I'm willing to do on Friday. So that's been a really good thing. If the time zone change is kind of impacting me, I will be conscientious about how I spread them, you know, across timeline so I'm not too upside down or if I'm upside down they know three days is here you know four days off because now I need to make sure I have that single day of brain recovery to enjoy where I'm going yeah. so it's been it really has been you know a pleasant process where we talk about building and coping skills so what can you unlock if this happens and we talk about practicing those things so I've really been able to have the flex I needed and then be flexible with my clients. So if they're like, hey, I really need to get in, but I can't get in until, you know, I'm off work at seven. And let's say I'm back on in the East Coast or, you know, Michigan, where that time zone is three hours. I'm like, you know, OK, well, then to late to work it is. So my family knows we can spend breakfast and maybe a half inch of lunch together. But, you know, by one, a, you know, 1 p.m. 
Eastern Standard Time. It's about 10 a.m. in the you know Pacific Standard Time. So I'm like, I'm at work by one. So it's also pretty fun to just have mornings off or, you know, kind of adjust your schedule in that way. So it's been it's been a good time. That's cool. So you've really worked out a good system for how you do it. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's you know, it's hard, but I think you all model some really good things about make sure you set yourself up and be prepared. I think that's one of the things on the front end is check that time zone. Mm-hmm. before you know making sure oh, like like that place and your surprise is 14 hours ahead like when i was in <laughs> thailand i was like uh so, oh my gosh i don't know what day it is over there how do you make it work and so my favorite cheat has been that weather app so oh and all the time oh the weather app how do you tell us i don't know so, okay so you let's say you're gonna be in so i was in bangkok so i added bangkok's weather in the little weather app and uh-huh. it shows you real time what the weather's like at the current time in the place where you want to be so that you can see, OK, it's nine o'clock here. It's 14 hours there. So it'll give you the time and weather for where you're going. So that way you can get used to seeing, OK, it's 10 o'clock now. It's this time here. This is what my schedule will look like. And so that's my pre prep when I'm going somewhere to say, OK, how can you accommodate your scheduling when where you're going is a day, you know, almost half a day ahead. What does that look yeah. like? So that's one of the pre prep and cheats I do to keep myself I love down. That, that is up. awesome. That is so good. <laughs> yeah, it really is. What I'm doing this time, I've never done it before. I've got everything set to Eastern time on my computer, my phone, <laughs> and my scheduling and all that is because in the Dominican, they don't do daylight savings time. So it's Atlantic time here, which I never, I don't even know what Atlantic time is until I've been here, but it's an hour off. <laughs> and it just, I cannot, I'm so bad with time zones. It's crazy. So, but it's been working really well, except for when I make appointments in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> <laughs> I I twice I've messed the hour up. I've s- scheduled it on Eastern time and forgotten that I was in Atlantic time. But but I'm working on it. But with my clients and these appointments like this, it's it's working beautifully for me just to have everything set in in the home time that works better for me. So, but I love that about the weather app. I'm gonna have to do that yeah. next time I'm going like like anywhere outside <laughs> my time zone. <laughs> exactly. It's awesome. Do you have any other little pre? Free tips like that? I, I never thought of doing. The other one I do is for my Apple Watch. So one of the things that we'll always do is give me, it's a feature where you add your local time zone. So I put in, right, Cupertino is in California where Apple is. So that means it's my time zone Pacific. So what I do is I keep that as my base on the watch of my Apple Watch. And when you travel somewhere else, it actually shows you plus or minus how many hours is different from your home time zone. Wow. So that is the other one. So as soon as I go somewhere and I'm checking, I'm like, oh, it's plus or minus, blah, blah, blah. So of course, right now it's at zero, but you go further east, it helps you out. If you go west, it helps you out. Or south, it helps you out, as we say. So you always kind of know how many hours you're off from mm-hmm. Oh, that's that cool. particular. Yeah. Wow, that's good. I like these. I like these tips and tricks. <laughs> that's awesome. Going in network with insurance can be tough. For example, waiting a year to get credentialed in some cases. Filing all the right paperwork is time consuming and tedious. And even after you're done, it could take months to get credentialed and start seeing clients. That's why Alma makes it easy and financially rewarding to accept insurance. When you join the insurance program, you can get credentialed within 45 days and access to enhanced reimbursement rates. They also handle all the paperwork from eligibility checks to claim submissions, and they guarantee payment within two weeks of each appointment. Once you've joined Alma's insurance program, you can see clients in your state of licensure, regardless of where you're working from. This is particularly exciting for me as a traveling therapist, as I know it is probably for you too. You can literally be anywhere and still see your clients through Alma. Learn more about building a thriving private practice with Alma at helloalma.com slash Kim. That's hello, A-L-M-A dot com slash K-Y-M to get started. So, so are you home right now or are you traveling somewhere? 
So I am home. I was in Jamaica a couple weeks ago at the start of the year. And one of the other things I started doing was going to other retreat builders events. And so that spark actually was really amazing. I was in Barcelona in April. I was at a retreat, so not necessarily working, seeing clients. But of course, the work doesn't stop. So, you know, emails are afoot. I know. But that's it. <laughs> so what I did there is I wound up meeting some really amazing therapists. And so a lot of us have kind of gotten together and talked about our projects and offered, you know, kind of these words of encouragement, which is how I met a couple people who were also doing you know, just kind of retreats and how we were figuring it out. And some of them were working in these other countries. Some of them were taking their classes in the countries and they'd be like, sorry, I'm going to be up at 2 a.m. because I have blah, blah, blah going on. Um, So it was even then having that opportunity to see, do, respond, which I love that scheduled email feature in Microsoft. Like, yes, send this at the appropriate time zone. So the clients aren't like, why is she emailing me at 2 a.m.? So I hit <laughs> that book. They know I have boundaries. So. That's so smart. Yeah, it's been some of those sorts of like little tips and tricks that, you know, you don't really know where they come from, but it's such a beneficial use of time. And so that being able to go to a couple of those. So Barcelona was in Portugal in October. And then, you know, being encouraged just to travel on my own, just professionally to see places I would like to be for a while. So I had no idea if I would love you know, France and Paris and, you know, those sorts of places. Then you get there and you're like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to come back here. I get with, oh, no, I, oh, I could stay here. Even when I was in Lisbon, I was like, oh, this is a city I could. I loved Lisbon. I swear. I was like, I could just totally. It's like San Francisco almost. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. right. You know, mm-hmm. I loved it. Yeah. I felt the same way. Yeah, but that's where I was like, oh, this is a little sample of like personal vacation, but also, oh, yeah, I could set up here. Food's great. People are easy. The weather's beautiful. Yes. Those are some of those highlights and being able to catch my pinch of Spanish Mm -hmm. for the kids. I mean, they spoke a lot of people had a little bit more Spanish, like versus when I was in Brazil and they were like, it's Portuguese or bus. But at least in Lisbon, it was like, oh, no Portuguese. Everybody had a side shoot of Spanish. So we were all able to kind of finagle around with our all broken Spanish in some parts, but super cool. That's awesome. That is so cool. Yeah. So you're just living the best life. I mean, going on retreats and checking places out and all of that. That's amazing. And do you think you'll just keep where you are right now just a home base and travel or you ever think you might just go international completely or oh I totally have dreams of an expat I will say I've been on my mind for a long time it was like I you know the Facebook memories and it was like you know this many years ago you said you would blah 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 and I'm like I'm so close to getting there but I think the figuring out what I wanted to do to be able to leave the country I think was really the hardest part of the journey is not knowing what job would get me the ability so that I could work away, you know, because before it was always the dream as I saw it of like the retiree, like, oh, I'm going to retire and live in this country. And I was like, well, I don't want to wait till I retire, but what can I do? And so it was very recent that I saw therapists like yourself on the go. And I said, holy crap, my dream is possible. And these folks are doing it. So I've been kind of observing those, you know, trials and tribulations and successes of people living and meeting each other abroad. And it's really inspired me. I think I can see this happening in about T minus five years. I mean, I'm I'm putting it out there, universe. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And in the meantime, it sounds like you're doing a lot of really awesome travel and making it work and still able to see your clients. Yeah. That's so cool. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> So you're also pivoting a little bit too, right? Like you're seeing clients, but you're also pivoting to try to get some other income streams going and all of that stuff. Do you want to maybe share about that a little bit? Like what you're what you're creating and putting out there in the world and how that process is going for you? I'd love to share some of that inspiration for people too, because, you know, we get tired with the one-to-one. It's It's good to have some other things going on, I think. Yes, indeed. So a couple of things that I have been working on. So I had this dream of creating a therapy workbook and I have been working on some activities that I have used with my clients and the progress I've seen them make using these activities kind of made my heart smile. And the activities aren't so rooted in like therapy jargon where it's a book for therapists to use with clients, even though therapists can, it's a book for lay people without all this 
therapeutic jargon because so much of it is out there. It's just brass tacks. Hey, good communication looks like this. You know, we all have those moments where we are lonely or isolated or frustrated, depressed. This is how this activity reminds you, find your support people, put it this way. So before things get bad, know your indicators. If you wake up in the morning and that sadness is there, don't wait to look for something that makes you feel better. Pre-plan those activities. So I kind of talk about that, different communication styles, ultimately to build people up to tell their story. And literally, I think I call the activity, I need a story. Oh, As a play on things, me and my brother used to say, as well as, oh, I need this. And it'd be like, I need a, so it was our form of kind of joking saying, when you need something, here's it. So that therapy workbook, I just had the first draft printed, which will be for sale. I had also designed journal just kind of to help people remember, you know, first have a vision and do a little vision board. That's kind of how it starts. And then you can get kind of some journaling in. And so I immediately got feedback that some people can't think of prompts. So the second edition has about 30 prompts to just kind of help people if they need to doodle. But now I'll partner that with the exercise because it reminds people track your wins, you know, do these things to just remember you're doing well. It doesn't have to be the size of the, you know, Grand Canyon. It could be the fact that you made it out of bed to your bathroom without stubbing your toe or hitting your funny bone. We got to get to like super small joy. So these kind of steps get people there. And with that being said, I know I've seen a lot of documentation and people are like, I'm behind on notes. And so I thought about like in grad school, I worked doing, my work was we were accepting Medicaid and I worked with students in school. And one of the things I say about Medicaid is they'll teach you how to write a treatment plan in a note real oh, yeah. quick so you don't get that money. Oh, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> so it was a great lesson at a very early time in my clinical career where I learned to do documentation. And not only that, Medicaid has a timeline. You are submitting your notes to them 50 years behind. So the speed of turning your notes over you know, became a thing. But this is before I could go sit at a computer and do therapy, you know, and when you're doing therapy with kids and it's play therapy, you can't stop and go take a note on the computer, but you can jam on some things and just kind of do some hand notes. So I became very efficient at hand notes and then transitioned that to a documentation course that I'm working on getting on because I know there's some ways of kind of having AI get in there and help you. But because I grew up with writing efficient note, just in general, I like to say that process is one that for me, if you don't figure out how to use AI, this isn't great. Even if you use AI, this is a great alternative to be on your team who may not be comfortable using AI, maybe some of these newer therapists or, you know, seasoned folks like me who you know, when I think about it, I'm like, my note is just happening in real time, how I track information. And so teaching people the art of you can document and still get your notes done, give yourself that 10, 15 minute grace. So my notes are done every client that 10 minute awesome. window is wow. finished, you know, so I don't get to the end of my day and have 20 unwritten notes. You know, at, at the end of my day, I might have two because I decided to goof off. So the documentation <laughs> yeah. course is coming and then One. I'm super excited about it. And then the other piece is a four-part series because I am a trauma specialist. That's my bread and butter. And so I call the work I do new kids on the block. So I talk uh -oh. about how anxiety, depression, trauma, and grief all go together. So if I treat one, I treat all four because you don't have one, in my opinion, without having all four. Uh, yeah. So that is a course I'm developing right now. I'm doing the grief portion. So it'll be four parts because... It's pretty cool information. So each part, you know, you can buy individually or you'll be able to buy as a whole. It's a super helpful program that I think allows for folks to see trauma, grief, anxiety, and depression in different ways. And I like to say I didn't start my life as a social worker, so I'm not one of those folks that were born and bred. I will say in that regard to be in the helping profession, I was an engineering student. And that's what I knew I was going to be. There wasn't a moment in Lenora's life where she didn't think she would be an engineer. Mm -hmm. Got an internship and was like, oh, I don't think I can do this. What am I going to do? So in that spiraling of body controlness <laughs> that happens in college, uh, I found yeah. criminal justice and forensic science. And it altered the course of my life in ways that I can't explain. And 
I got my first internship at the coroner's office. And that was really when I started to understand well, grief in a different way and loss in a different way. Mm-hmm. And also joy. The folks wow. who work in the coroner's office, when I tell you the joy and laugh we wow make the days <laughs> like I mean the sense of humor is in there you know was unmatched and uh, I still tell some of those jokes to this day one of my favorite ones is what do you call a D student in medical school mm-hmm. what doctor like we just had these moments where you could just laugh about things and so I had no idea Funny. the way to find joy would happen to me in that environment that it was so present that our coping skills had to be right there or the work you did would really pull you into some dark places and that's where I really started that bond but having that engineering background really allowed for me to look at things at its tiniest start point you know that mm-hmm. Where did this come from? How did we get here? And how can we build a solid program? So all the engineering work helped me understand the logic of treatment plans, which also because of the engineering work and the science allowed for me to say, okay, this is a bit of a science fair project. Let's see what the hypothesis is. Let's see when we collect this data. And so I might pivot when I see, okay, this is how the progress is not moving forward. Instead of waiting, quick pivot here, not change anything else to see if that's efficiently helping. So I will say in that regard, I fell into social work by encouragement of some really cool social workers at the University of Florida Hospital. So Shan's social work mother baby team really got me me to apply because I was investigating child abuse. And so they kind of encouraged me to go be a social worker. And as they say, the rest is history. Wow, that is so amazing. You know, I just I love hearing the background of what goes into creating these other income streams, because it really for all of us, it's really culmination of like all of our experiences and how we've learned and sort like to just hear you talk about the coroner's office and the engineering and how it ties into documentation. It just it's so interesting to me and the grief process. And it's just I just love that so much. And You know, people will say, oh, there's too many documentation courses or whatever out there, but there's not because there's not your documentation course from your perspective as an engineer, how to how to make this efficiently work for you. Like, it sounds like you've got processes for it that would really help people. And it just it's always so interesting to me to hear, like, how did this come about? And then to be able to, like, give that gift, put it into a form that people can buy it and use it and and be all the better for it. It's just I just love that so much. And I love hearing the process behind it. It's really, really cool to hear you share that. So when you get the links to everything, give them to me so I can add them into this episode. And so people can, that listen later, can come and like check out all of your offerings around all this. Yeah, I'd love it. Yeah, you know, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I think, you know, the goal, lastly, if I will throw in, is kind of doing some retreat building as well. So we're looking at offering some retreats. We're starting with kind of the overwhelmed woman. And so we know those folks in these executive roles or leadership roles or even private practice owners that don't necessarily call ourselves executives. And because we don't use that terminology, you know, coming from corporate world, if you did or didn't work in that corporate sphere, knowing how isolating it could be and how supportive of you know, folks are out there. Like I said, I found this wonderful tribe of women, not in my state, but at a retreat in Barcelona. We have a running group message. We check in with each other. We became these Facebook friends. We have LinkedIn connections and we are supporting each other in a variety of ways. One of the therapists who I met does a, you know, a retreat out of Atlanta. So she's going to have me come and be a speaker there in, in June and I was on another therapist out of Jersey. I did her podcast, you know, and so it's all these connections that we've made that I'm so happy these people are a part of my life. And so offering that to not just the overwhelmed woman, but we are looking at helping that weekend thing for the overwhelmed mom who really just needs a quick getaway. And we teach them, you know, a little bit of coping skills, a little bit of life learning, and then also the art of having fun. So kind of taking the mystery out of yes you can have all these things going on in your life and still find time for you and it looks like this because let's be real nobody gave us a recipe on being organized nobody you know after being a little kid with having a dedicated bedtime if you did those things kind of go away the further you get on that adulthood chain so 
it's just kind of reminding folks to schedule in joy like they schedule in a dental appointment. Both things are important. Let's kind of get you taken care of. So I'm really ex excited about the retreats. And then, of course, you know, we always love helping therapists because we get all wound up, too. So every Audi is going to be welcome. But I'm super excited to be on, you know, to be on track of finding ways to help people. And I think ultimately that's my joy system being filled as well. So thank you for really giving me an opportunity to talk about those things as well as being able to put the links in at a later date. So I greatly appreciate that. Oh, thank you so much. And and thanks for just really talking about the joy part and sharing about the corners. And, you know, it sounds like you do need to schedule that and really take take it into account and incorporate it into your life, especially with this hard work that we do. I mean, it sounds like it's a key ingredient to not burning out, really, especially in really serious jobs like being a coroner or a therapist, you know? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. I love talking to you. We'll add the links later. And for now, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, how do they reach out to you? Where do they find you? So uh, you can find me. My website is L lcn wellness so listen here nourish lcn wellness.com that's me and i'm on instagram at lcn wellness as well and those are the biggest spots i have a blog that kind of runs we post community things mental health things and i really just love talking about important you know kind of helpful things for the community so it's a resource for everyone. So those are my spots available. Email support at lcnwellness.com. All sorts of ways to get in contact with me. And again, thanks for that offer. Thank you so much. Wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much for listening to the Traveling Therapist podcast. For show notes, links, and downloads, head over to thetravelingtherapist.com where you'll be able to learn more about my journey, the courses I've created for you, and other exciting resources to make your dreams become a reality. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share with your traveling therapist friends, subscribe to the podcast, and if you love this episode, please leave a review.